Thank you, Donna. And thank you all for coming, and good morning. I, do have, I did have one extra announcement, which is you may see these uh, name badges around this week with the flowers on them. Those are moderators in the Bible Reading Challenge in Facebook, so any of you from out of town who only know us maybe loosely in the Facebook group can recognize that. And these pins that are out there are for any of you who are in the Bible Reading Challenge already uh, or want to be. We don't care. We're not uptight. Just get a pin. <laughs> That's how it is. All right, so my topic today, anti-fragile mothering. What an interesting talk title. Uh, a somewhat crazy man uh, named Nassim Taleb has written a number of disruptive books, one of which contributed part of the title for this talk. Now, lest you assume that I have read the book, Anti-Fragile, let me assure you that I have not. I have not yet done that. My husband has. I have heard many things about it. Uh, I do, however, understand his thesis and the word he coined for the title. The basic concept of his book is urging us all to become anti-fragile, to build systems that are anti-fragile, and at the very least to understand certain properties and categories by which to see the world. He wants to provide a fuller understanding of risk and security, fragility and stress. He draws much from the world of investment since he is a financial trader. Uh, who just happens to dabble in Roman philosophers. Uh, by all accounts, he is as pompous as the day is long. Uh, this book receiving some scathing reviews, a special exhibit of pride being offended by pride in others. Uh, Nassim despises the pride of academics and oh my goodness, how they despise him. The New York Times review of this book starts this way. A reader could easily run out of adjectives to describe Nassim Nicholas Taleb's new book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. The first ones that come to mind are maddening, bold, repetitious, judgmental, intemperate, erudite, reductive, shrewd, self-indulgent, self-congratulatory, provocative, pompous, penetrating, perspicacious, and pretentious. They loved it, didn't they? They just thought that was great. The Guardian Review might be my favorite book review of all time because it had this subtitle, the author of The Black Swan has now written a baggy, dispiriting, antisocial mess of a book. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so the fact that he is a crazy wild card in the world of business and philosophy books, writing baggy and dispiriting tomes, may explain why I have not yet jumped into this book. But it does not explain why I titled a talk after it. And there are three, it's because there's so many things in what he describes that apply uh, to all of human life. There are three basic categories of things uh, which he lays out. The first is fragile, and I think we all know what that means. Uh, it means that stress of some kind will break it. When you have a crystal vase in a box, we mark it fragile, meaning handle this carefully. Don't throw it down the stairs and don't put it into especially difficult situations. There are fragile markets, fragile families, fragile, fragile jobs, fragile countries, really fragile everything. The second category is those things which he calls robust. Robust things do not break easily. They get in stressful situations and they don't break. Uh, you don't need to mark a box of tennis balls fragile because they are made to be thrown around and hit hard and they won't break when you do that to them. There are robust families and robust markets and robust ideas and robust individuals and robust cars. It's just a general life category, robustness. And the third category is the one we're all here to talk about which is anti-fragile. Taleb coined this word in an effort to describe the thing he is all about. And that is, it is the things which actually gain through stress and disorder. The things that, instead of just not breaking, they actually improve in those conditions. It's the opposite of fragile, because robust is not the opposite because it just doesn't break. The opposite is to change in a positive direction. To have stress, um, stress and chaos and disorder actually improve uh, the thing itself. So obviously, I thought this is the perfect word to put right in front of mothering. Oh, to be a mother who would exponentially grow and improve in stress and disorder and a little bit of chaos. Uh, just to harness that power, well, doesn't that seem like a great idea? I think it would be hard to mother uh, and not know about added stress and chaos and disorder in your life. There's just, there's just a lot of new variables. There's a lot of possibilities when you, when you bring children into the mix. 
Taleb uses examples that are familiar to us, the human body being one. When you exercise, your muscles all tear a little bit. They tear because then they recuperate and come back stronger. They prepare for the thing that is coming next. They recover by improving. Bone density is improved by lifting weights. It doesn't just not break your bones to lift heavy weights. It strengthens them. It actually improves them. Lying still for a week is not good for the human body. Right? If you could just hold still for a week, things would not improve. We are improved by the adversity of needing to walk around and fight gravity. Your body is actually doing that all the time, and it's good for you. We need pushback in order to thrive, and this is simply the way that it is. You can see how this is only in some ways true, though, because poking yourself in the eye does not give you better vision. Uh, stubbing your toes frequently is not the path to better toe health. Uh, Anti-fragility is sometimes a feature of living things, but it is not universally the case across living systems. Some things are anti-fragile and some are not. Your muscles are anti-fragile within reason, but your fingernails are not. If human beings were completely fragile by nature, then those of us who exercise the most would be the weakest. Torn muscles that never turned into strength, you would have no advantage. Right? But it's not the way it is. The idea uh, behind uh, Taleb's book is to think about all of this so that we might build anti-fragile systems and lives and businesses and investments and personality traits. When we find ways to thrive in risky, chaotic situations, we have made risk no longer risky, but rather the safe bet. Chaos, stress, trouble, surprise are all just givens in life. We know the world is not predictable. When you can thrive in those situations, you have made that chaotic world that we know to be the way it is, the safe world. What I think is so fascinating about this whole topic is that Taleb seems to have found some threads that he is picking up from the frayed edges of the gospel. He has found truth narratives that have their origin in the creator God and in the story of our salvation, and he's trying to make a big theory about it. His big theory just straight up ticks the world off. A baggy anti-social message that no one likes, uh, which seems to please him because he assumes it makes him stronger. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's out antagonizing people just for exercise. Uh, we all know something of the antifragility of the human body from experience, but those of us who know God might think of other examples. We should think of other examples. What of gold and silver being refined? What about iron sharpening iron, or a faithful friend wounding? What about a father disciplining those he loves? The means that our God uses to grow us exponentially are simply not predictable to the world. They aren't, but they should be predictable and recognizable to a Christian. Zechariah 13.9, I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Isaiah 48.10, behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Malachi 3.1, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Proverbs 17, three, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. 1 Peter 1, 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Psalm 66, 10, for you, O God, have tested us, you have refined us, as silver is refined. This is a theme of how God thinks of his people, right? Over and over and over, God's people will be refined in not particularly gentle ways right? Into the fire seems to be what the Lord says over and over. And worldly encouragement cannot accommodate this reality. If you aren't in Christ, any resistance to how you have been doing, how you're performing, how you feel about your job is just like a mean poke in the eyeball with nothing at all like a good workout. 
You can be refined in some ways, of course, learning skills and self-improving, uh, but there is no way without God to handle the reality of sin. There is no way to process sorrow or trial being used actually, not just something you'll survive, if you are lucky, robust, but sorrow and trial and difficulty actually coming back far more glorious, right? That's not a category for the world. Well, Taleb is trying to make it one, but, it, it, but genu genuinely people don't understand it. They think that can't happen. The assumption is that the goal is to stay out of pain and painful situations and difficulty because people cannot imagine a world where pain can mean something good. They cannot imagine our world. Let's say that you're having a difficult time. Maybe you have a number of little kids and that you are at the end of your capacity. I've never been in this position, so <laughs> going to imagine it for those of you who have been there. Uh, you're looking what appears to be the bottomless pit of needs in a completely empty tank uh, as far as caring goes. You know, you think, I remember seeing a, a tank top that really spoke to my heart once that said, in memory of when I used to care. It's like, I remember that. I remember the days when I used to think I could do something neat. Uh, you are looking at the dishes, at the laundry, at the noses, at the sticky floor, at the work that feels endless, and the children whose attitudes are mimicking yours. It's always the cherry on top. Things are just not looking good. It's not going well. Well, if you take that struggle to the world, looking for encouragement and comfort, what can they tell you? They can tell you, that they are sorry you made such poor life choices, <laughs> right? And one of the things my husband will tell me sometimes, which always turns it around for me, is when he says, yeah, this, this is why people think seven, having, having seven children is something you shouldn't do. You know, like, this is what we signed up for. Like, this is why everyone else says you're crazy to do this, which I'm always like, we're not crazy, no. Never mind. <laughs> uh, this is why people don't have children. You should have avoided this risk. Sorry you didn't get the memo in time. They can tell you that you need to leave all this struggle and mess. You need to follow your heart and your dreams to some other kind of a place. They can tell you to demand that your husband do more housework and that you are really deserving of much more rest or at least wine or yoga or something. <clears throat> they can tell you that you are amazing and that you shouldn't feel bad about anything. Don't feel bad about anything, no matter what you've been doing. What they cannot tell you, because they do not believe it and they do not understand it, is that you are being refined. This is difficult, and that is good. This is hard. This is revealing both your own sin and God's intention to rid you of it, right? This is not easy, and it was never supposed to be easy. You are growing. They cannot tell you to not lose hope, that God is working in and through you something exponentially more glorious than what you can see today. They cannot encourage you that this is the means he has ordained to make you into something better, to build his kingdom and to manifest his glory here in your life. The glory of our faith is Jesus Christ. The glory of our faith is that the only son of God was born to a woman. He was humbled, he struggled, he suffered, and then he died. He died for us. He died on a cross, although he despised the shame. He died as a man. Think about that. God, his son, died as a man. He died innocent, and yet he died with the weight of all our guilt on his shoulders. He died with all of God's wrath on him. He became sin for us. He became shame for us. And then what happened? You know the story. He conquered all of that, and he came back from the dead as a victor. Colossians 2.14 says this, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over, triumphing over them in it. I love that. Like the principalities and powers, having done all those things, having been humbled and shamed and received the whole wrath of God is how he conquered all the principalities and powers, 
right? He conquered everything by doing that. 1 Peter 3.21 says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. In that moment, that's, that is how he went there. This is what he did for the glory. This is what he accomplished. Christ was made guilty for the sake of righteousness. He became shame for the sake of glory. He was made dishonor for the sake of victory over the principalities and powers. And he is at the right hand of God the Father now reigning over everything. He reigns there now over your busy and blindingly tired day with the children. This God, your king, is reigning today over your fears and your tasks and your problems. He is reigning and he has already conquered and he is currently completely in charge. And how do you think our God gets things done? By the means of fire and for the sake of glory, right? This is how he does it. This is what he's doing in your life right now. Fire of some kind for glory of his making. The passion of Christ in his resurrection from the dead is the archetype of anti-fragility. It is the thing that Taleb's trying to pick up the, the shadows and the memories of what was accomplished by Christ. He's finding those themes in creation and trying to somehow think if we could take advantage of this. The Christians in China right now are being anti-fragile in the face of persecution because Christ is anti-fragile and they are part of his bride. They cannot help being anti-fragile. Though they are beaten and robbed and abused, they will be glorified, right? They will be. There is nothing that can stop that from happening. Those who are persecuting the church now would not be doing this if they had any idea what God will accomplish through it, just like they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they had only known what it would accomplish. 1 Peter 5.10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He will do that himself. This God, this King, this Savior, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So why, I ask you, are we acting like this is a job opening in our lives? Looking for someone to restore us. Looking for someone to strengthen us. Looking like we just need someone to help establish us. If we could just get established and encouraged and strengthened. Why? Why? Why would we ever want to go ask someone else how to deal with our tiredness, with our broken feelings, with our hopelessness, with our despair, with our fatigue, with the kids' attitudes, with our lack of desire to keep working on it? When you were bought and paid for with the blood of the Lamb who is now reigning over heaven and earth, why would you go look to like, I don't know, a Pilates instructor who looks pretty together? Uh, to give you life advice? What's that about? Any random life coach with the internet and access to stupid memes? Please, tell me more. Like, tell me more about how amazing I actually am. We do this when we think that we are fragile people, right? We look at our damages and we imagine our potential damages in this wild world and we start looking for padding and packing and we want people to fill our boxes up with packing peanuts to keep us safe from chaotic shifts and hardship and struggle, right? Just give me some little things to keep me safe. Uh, we do it when we forget who our God is and we forget what that means about who we are. It cannot be helped. You will be glorified. This will be glorified in Christ. We do this when we are simply struggling with unbelief. We, when we don't believe that our God is who he says he is and that he is doing with us what he says he is doing with us. The world is full of fragile people. But if you are in Christ, you are necessarily not one of them. As I say to my little boys often, whose name is on your head? To whom, women, to whom do you belong? 
right? Whose name is on your head? What has any Pinterest board or Instagram account ever done to earn your trust? What do they know about you, about your life and your reasons for your struggles or about the actual purpose in any of it, the long-term reason for this? They simply do not. For all they know, you are actually a creepy stalker of young girls. You could be a murderer, and they are all here to tell you that you are worthy as you are, and you should really eliminate toxic people from your life. You should do that, right? They know nothing about you, and so they cannot possibly be speaking the truth about you. I recently saw an ad, you've probably all seen this also, uh, for a wellness and self-care texting service, and I may have gone down that rabbit hole. I don't know why. Why did I feel compelled? Uh, this is their quote, a daily self-compassion coach in your pocket. Learn how to talk to yourself like a friend and feel more in control of your thoughts, feelings, and actions. 95% of members say that shine helps them feel more resilient. I read their guidelines for writers. They want fresh, novel, positive, encouraging, different, modern, deep words. Just no calls for action. Just sort of... They said something like, know how you could be better and more you are already worthy. They want us to be raw and tell people that they're already enough. Uh, but why is there this need for thousands more words of all the same stuff to shoot into people's pockets daily? Because it is not holding up, right? They need more packing peanuts. Give me more packing peanuts. Every day I want to wake up to my cell phone dinging with little additional padding from the reality of my own sin and this problem, right? I just want to hear some things. There is a video on the internet, the kind of video that the internet was made for. Someone giving a raccoon cotton candy. I hope you've seen it. If you know cotton candy, I mean, if you know raccoons, they wash everything before they eat it. So what it does is these funny little black paws with a little pink cotton candy, and then he sticks it in a puddle and it's just psh, gone. And it's just these hilarious little black paws like frantically feeling around the puddle for where did my cotton candy go? Where did it go? And, and so he's, he's, but it's very funny. And it's exactly what we're doing with this kind of junkus, right? We're saying, feed me more stuff. And then as soon as it hits our real life in any kind of resistance, it's just gone, right? It's not there, I don't feel better anymore. What did you do? I have nothing, where'd it go? Frantic little black hands in the puddle. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> Wasn't it all pink and fluffy? It felt, it was gonna be great. Uh, but I'll tell you what that raccoon needs. He needs the Shine app. <laughs> Cotton candy, delivered moment by moment. You won't notice that this doesn't last so long as we just keep putting more of it into your hands. You all probably already know how I feel about reading the Bible. You probably already have heard me get all whipped up on this subject, but I suppose that that will not keep me from doing it again. Daily self-compassion in your pocket in a cell phone that runs out of battery power. Why would you need that? Is your pocket better than your heart? Is that anonymous fake encourager better than the ruler of the universe? Is a text in the morning to set the tone for the day going to be anything more than a packing peanut between you and what God has ordained for you to walk in? Don't you, oh, I don't know, maybe have access to something better? Something realer? Something true? Something that stands up to the puddle of your real life and instead makes your trials and hardships the things that cannot endure, right? Don't you have access to that already? Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your God knows you and he gave you a word to change you. But the next verse, which is not as often quoted, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The one with whom we have to do. The one whose name is on your head. 
seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What is a time of need? It's a time when in the flesh we are fragile. It is a time when our spirit is weak, when our circumstances are challenging, and our comfort is gone. It is a time when we need to not be walking in natural life, but in new life. Not in the flesh, which is fragile, but in the spirit, which makes us anti-fragile. We need to embrace not some kind of self-help robustness or stoicism, but a full-on anti-fragile gospel courage. We know our God. We know his ways. We trust him. We need to be walking in the confidence of the resurrection. Because, you guys, we actually believe that that happened. Right? We don't just say it on Sunday. We believe that Jesus died and he came back. And he's at the right hand of God the Father after, incidentally, stopping in Hades to preach to all the principalities and powers who were being bad in the time of the flood that they had lost, right? Stopping by to tell them all, it's over, it's done. But how can any of this apply to the topic specifically of mothering? I guess my question is, how can it not? How can this not be in your everyday life as a Christian? and as a Christian woman. First of all, a big place that we do really need to apply this. The world is in a constant fuss about how women are too fragile for motherhood. They won't say it like that, but it is what they think, right? You are too fragile for this. Have we not all been told about the horrors that will befall women if they get pregnant when they did not mean to? right? We've been told, right? We've heard that. Then we are told about all of the dangers and the things that might break us. You will lose your figure, lose your body. It will change your relationship with your husband. It will give you new worries and hormonal problems. You will probably struggle with depression and alienation from all of your friends who are still single and living the good life, right? Your work will suffer. People will be rude about breastfeeding. You will need to join online organizations to fight their rudeness about it. <laughs> Everyone will judge you for everything. You can't handle it, right? You will get into this horrible world where everyone's mean to you and you can't be who you want to be. Uh, most of the time, you won't be able to sleep. Uh, and you will be totally ruined by mom guilt, which is something extra and special that we made up just to haunt you. <laughs> oh, no, look! the world says, something that might hurt you is in there, right? So you're too fragile for that. Don't go there. You'll break. If you really must do it for some weird reason, let us make you a million packing peanuts of lies and try to keep you safe. But you know what the Christian response is to that? Of course there is stuff in there that might hurt. Bring it on, right? Take your packing peanuts from hell and let me hold fast my profession. Let me walk with the God who walked through it all on my behalf and let me become more like him. Let it hurt. Let it destroy and tear down. Let it disrupt and trouble and stretch me and try me like nothing else would have done. Because you know what? That's the whole point. And I just love the glory. I love the exponential growth. I love resurrection life. I love life abundant. I love my children who will learn from me what the Christian life looks like, what we're doing, who we are, whose name is on our head. And I love my king and his glory, and I intend to be a good soldier for Jesus, and by the power of the spirit who dwells in me, I will be one. I am a Christian, and so I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Lord intends to glorify me in himself and that he who has begun that good work will see it completed. No matter if I expected my life to look like this or not, 
It doesn't matter. It's what he expected my life to look like. My ideas are not his ideas, and his ideas are better. I know that the work that God has called me to do is the perfect work for me to be doing, and that he is using me to build his kingdom. And I know that whatever I do in his name here will be raised and glorified in him. I simply cannot lose. We also have many, many peers who are not holding fast their profession, right? The world says all of these things, and the temptation for a Christian is that there is always an easy excuse, right? Everyone believes you. I remember at one point in my life when the twins were babies, so I had infant twins and then a one-year-old and a two-year-old, three-year-old, just three, three, one babies. And I realized that I could say anything and no one will argue with you. You know, if you say like, it's so hard, everyone would be like, I'm sure it's really, really hard, you know? Like, and you realize that I had this big out. I had, to, I had to consciously cut that out. Like this was an escape route I could take all the time if I wanted to. And all of us have that with what the world is offering us all the time. So you wanna feel fussy about how your friend did a great birthday party for her kid and it made you feel bad about the birthday party that wasn't as good that you did for your You can blog about that and get everyone to get on board with your big fuss and feel sorry for you and recommend Instagram pages of things to follow and stuff to get, get all on the cause of, of, of excuses and things instead of just enduring the kinds of things that we need to endure to be refined to lean on God and to, and to confess our sins and to pursue him in spite of the difficulties and in spite of the obstacles. We live in a world that's trying to remove the difficulties from what we have to do, and it can't be removed. You can't make it easy for gold to be refined in a furnace if you're the gold, you know? It's going to feel like something happening in there. But we have many peers who are not holding fast their profession, and it is our own heart's tendency Many women spend all of their parenting energy and time trying to remove the risks, trying to remove daily struggles and things that could make us cling to God, right? How can I, how can I make it so that my kids are not annoying or frustrating? What should I do about that? How can I do that? Like, because I, I need to change this because I'm not going to be able to live through another annoying episode with children. Uh, we want to fix it so that we don't have to be refined, instead of realizing that this is God's means to refine us and refine them and change the world through all of this. We want guaranteed results in some kind of perfect plug and chug so that you will never struggle kind of method. We want to take away all the abrasive problems of living with a bunch of people because it feels like it will break us. I have seven children and things can occasionally get pretty realistic at our house. I love a good system to streamline disorder and chaos, but I also know all too well the temptation of looking for a system when what you need is faith, right? You need to hold fast your profession because this is not actually about the snow clothes, right? This is something else. <laughs> this is a more spiritual level that we're, that we're dealing with. Raising children is not and was never meant to be an easy breezy task just isn't. Raising children in the faith will require courage. You will have to show them what it is to be broken for glory. His strength is made perfect in our weakness, which is why Christians are not to be dwelling on our weaknesses, because even those are all about his strength, right? Even our failings are about his glory. Even our weakness is not about our weakness, and it's not about endless things about how weak we are. It is about how strong our Savior is. You will have to show your children how to receive challenges from God. We have to show them how to live an anti-fragile life, not always trying to protect ourselves from the refiner's fire or shield our faces from the blows of conviction. We receive what God has called us to with the courage of people who are called after the name of Jesus. We know whom we follow. I was reminded when writing this of a glorious hymn that I'm sure you all know, but you know when you sing it, you don't always hear what it's actually saying. Glorious things of thee are spoken, holy city of our God, 
He whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living water springing from eternal love. Well supply thy blessed members and all fear of want remove. Who can faint when such a river ever flows their thirst to assuage? Grace, which like the Lord the giver, never fails from age to age. Blessed constituents of Zion, washed in the Redeemer's blood, Jesus whom their souls rely on, makes them kings and priests to God. Tis his love his people raises over self to reign as kings, and as priests his worthy praises each his thankful offering brings. Savior, if of Zion city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity. I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his, all his boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's members know. Solid joys are not the cotton candy, right? I love that image because I love the idea, solid joy, lasting treasure, things that will be glorified eternally. And obviously, this includes our children. And the thing that mothers always are struggling with is not the value of their children, but the stupid obstacles and difficulties of our own sinfulness, right? Our own sinfulness and theirs, all of us, sinners fallen together. But certain things last forever, right? Anything done in Jesus and in his name will last forever. Your children will last forever. You will be glorified eternally in Christ. Father in heaven, we praise you for your merciful, abundant, compassionate kindness to us. Lord, we thank you for the solid joys and the lasting treasures that you have given to us. May we all be enabled through your spirit to hold fast to our profession and pursue you through whatever refining fires you have prepared for us. May we embrace your glorious purposes for us with joy, and may we run with our eyes fixed on your glorious Son, in whose name we pray, and amen.